Good evening. Today is May 21st, 2015. The time is 7 p.m. This is the monthly meeting of the Beach Grove Redevelopment Commission. My name is Donald Webb. I am the president of the Beach Grove Redevelopment Commission, and I'd like to introduce our members starting from my right. I'm Janice King, member. Kathy Chappell, secretary. Ron Moat, vice president. And Mac Belner, Belner member. Um, Ms. Story could not be with us tonight. She is a non-voting member of the RDC, but um, she couldn't make it, so... <coughs> We're going to start with, or first, we'll start off with the minutes. Um, any questions or anything to do with last month's meeting minutes or from the 16th of April? If not, I'll make a motion. I'll ask for a motion to approve the minutes. I'll make a motion. Ask for a second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, the minutes for the May 16th meeting were approved. Um, <clears throat> I'd like to do the bills first, get those out of the way. This month, we are going to pay $41,031.10 in bills. Uh, the biggest one will be United Consulting for $24,720 and $5,180. That is doing work for the Churchman Avenue project, part of that grant that we agreed. Um, Crossroads Engineering, $280360 and $1,120. That's the Greenway Trail that we also agreed. Uh, our sewer bill from the landfill, of seven dollars and fifty cents russell excavating six thousand and twelve hundred that is for removal rem, excuse me removal of the tennis courts and putting down grass and dirt and cleaning that up and that was a total of what seventy two hundred dollars for a total of forty one thousand thirty one dollars and ten cents i would now ask for a motion to approve the payment of those. are there any questions on these bills then i'd ask for a motion to approve so move second second all in favor? Aye. 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 All right. Um, that is the bills. <coughs> so um, next order of business, Trent has an appointment at 8, so he asked if he could go first tonight. I said, sure. So Trent from Crossroads Engineering will speak to us about the Greenway. Hopefully good news. Thank you, everybody, and uh, thanks for uh, accommodating me on early on the schedule. Um, Trent Newport with Crossroad Engineers. Uh, with me uh, tonight is Michael Kershell with Schneider Corporation, and as you know, uh, we are under contract with um, the RDC to do some uh, preliminary work uh, towards uh, the revival of the Greenway Trail uh, through the city of Beach Grove. Uh, this exhibit here, as well as the ones that you have in handout, uh, is kind of uh, an exhibit to show you what we've been going forward with some meetings and so forth. Uh, it's a, it shows, um, it shows the route, uh, from third or from main street, um, uh, you know, at north of Sarah Bolton park and then coming down through the park, uh, along, uh, Lick Creek and along Beach Creek, uh, connecting to, uh, the intermediate school and then eventually connecting over to Emerson Avenue to where Hornet Avenue is. Uh, there's some alternate, uh, routes along there. A lot of those are to be decided uh, based on public input and design parameters and so forth. But this is a pretty good uh, idea of the route that we're trying to get funded in the fall. Uh, what we've been told is that um, we, we actually did go meet with the MPO, uh, the staff, and the mayor joined us for that meeting. Had a very good meeting with them about uh, the chances of funding this project. Uh, they were very supportive of the project. Uh, they said that the funding application that's coming up in the fall will be open uh, in October and uh, closed uh, just before Thanksgiving, and then decisions will be made after that. Uh, so we basically have between now and then to uh, do some things that will help um, uh, the application. Uh, so some of those we've already started with, which is obviously meeting with MPO staff to talk about the project and make sure that they understand, make sure that we are aware of what the best funding categories are to go after, uh, to make the commitment that the city, you know, one of the things they're going to want to know is, is the city committed if we get funding to do your part of the project uh, financially? And so obviously that's going to be a big part of it. We'll probably have to have a letter of support from the city council, maybe the RDC, eventually when we get to that point. Um, but also public support uh, for the project. Um, I've already went to the school board meeting uh, this past month. Uh, Janice was there, and uh, the school board was very receptive of the project and very supportive. Uh, they actually uh, took a vote to support it, so we'll be getting a letter 
from the superintendent uh, showing the support of the school board, which is critical because as we said here, it's connecting you know, at least three school properties uh, uh, from, from one end to the other. And so that's a, a critical component to know that we have that support. And then obviously the other support uh, that's within there are the parks and then the neighborhoods. And so um, Michael's gonna talk a little bit about um, what our next step is to gain that bigger sub public support um, you know, from the neighborhoods. Good evening. Michael Crochelle with Schneider. Um, Trent and I have been kicking this around, thinking about what's the best way to engage the neighbors. Um, it's easier to get those that live immediately along the proposed route. It's a little harder to get those further away. Uh, we've been looking at schedule, and, and it's good that we have till October, really November, before this is due. Um, we were thinking about August uh, and trying to possibly piggyback on this meeting uh, the third week of August and we wanted to float this idea to you guys we can talk about it tonight um, our thought would be that we invite the neighborhood folks from Carrington and just north of there to an open house and really anybody in Beach Grove but to an open house that evening at six o'clock um, we can sort of informally share with them and, and get their feedback for half an hour uh, 45 minutes prior to this meeting um, and then we could wrap up with a more formal presentation at 6.30 with those folks, or we could do something that's part of your meeting that night. Um, that's where we're looking for your opinion about it, but it might be a good way um, to have plenty of lead time to get the word out to the neighborhood folks, have an opportunity to invite them in. We can tell them what we're thinking. Uh, we can listen to their thoughts and their reaction to this. Uh, folks that have lived there a while saw a plan much like this seven, eight years ago, but that's, that's a long time. You've had turnover in the neighborhoods. You've forgotten the details. You've changed your mind. So we'd like to get them back together and uh, get some inputs before we start to really tighten up the budget and, and prepare something for the MPO. Yeah, and just to reiterate, we would, you know, this would go out through the city website, go out um, in many, as many ways as we could get it out to the general public. But we would also want to focus in, on those HOAs, get it to the to the person at the HOAs and those neighborhoods that are joining, make sure they get the word out, because uh, it, you know, although it's a, it's a, uh, it's a facility that's going to benefit everybody in in Beach Grove, you know, it probably has more effect to those that are living right there. So I know, I know you live in one of the neighborhoods, and I'll say, uh, yeah, I live in Carrington. <laughs> if if you need the HOA address or who handles our mail, I can get that for you. Yeah, we'll definitely want to gather that information, uh, but. Like Michael said, we, you know, public meeting probably in this space uh, would be good. You know, I, I would hope that we'd have enough to pack the room. Uh, we could do it. Certainly, if you don't want to do it on, uh, you know, a regular meeting, we could do it as a separate event. But uh, if we were going to do it on a regular meeting, we would probably pick the one in August, which yeah, I think yeah. is the 20th is what we said. 20th, yeah. Are you guys planning on doing like a mailer or? Um, I I don't know if we would do a, a mailer. We would probably do something that we would send out digitally, um, and we would put it on the website. We would, between now and then, having that much time, we'd be able to announce it at the next couple city council meetings. Right. Uh, get it out at this meeting. Um, I don't think you have be, one in July, but you might be able to put it on the board, on the electronic board, on 13th and Main. Oh yeah. Um, I think you just yes. have to ask Paul Kaiser. Okay. Yeah, uh, I so can't we can believe that he would. We could do it. some kind of those things. We'd certainly put it on the website, and then we would really hope to broadcast it through the HOAs right. via the presidents of the HOAs. You know. If they have a, a means already for distributing information, we'd like to mm -hmm. ask to use that. We'll find out if that's direct mailing. Then maybe we'll do it. But if it's yeah. email or a newsletter, we'll do it that way. This would not be the only public meeting. You know, if we get funding for the project, there will be public meetings as we go forward for the detailed design. Uh, the biggest thing is to get, you know, to get gain some support, get some information, try to gather, uh, like M Michael said, gather some feedback. But, uh, you know, we, we really love to show that the community is very supportive of the project and is behind it because that will help the application. Right. Well, whatever you guys need from us, just you got my email to, or our email, please let us know. I mean, like I say, we're putting money into it, so we want to definitely get something you know out of out it. of it right yeah 
Do you do you have an opinion on a separate meeting or you know piggyback I think the on idea it? Of having it at six, and then our meeting at seven would be fine because a it would limit your guys's to where we don't hear people either praising it for hours or complaining about it for hours. You know what I mean? Um, I'll be interested to see what type of turnout we can get for it. Yeah. You know, um, I would hope it would be better turnout. I think it will be a benefit to the community, but. Hey, you never know. But giving us this much time gives us some opportunity to get the word out. Sure. You know, we would even go back to the school board and say, hey, you've got a couple meetings or, yeah, mm -hmm. maybe one or two meetings between now and then. Can you announce it? You know, and so try to do those kind of things. Well, like I said, whatever support you need from us, I'll, I'll be able to help you to help you all I can. I know, I know where I mail my dues because Carrington uses AMI um, as their people to take care of all that. But do you get do you get notifications of any kind by e, by email? Get our bill every fall. By email <laughs> or by? They mail out a bill every okay. fall. But they've done. Our community in the past has done newsletters, and it might be something they might be receptive to do. Because yeah. I mean, it wouldn't be that expensive, and and you know, if you need help with that, I could, I could also help in talking to them and saying, hey, can you guys send out a mailer? Yeah. Um, I don't. Again, I don't think a mailer is a bad idea. If, if you know, and we also got different social media websites that we could go to right. and mention it as well. So, I, I to your point, I would like to see forty or fifty people, which to me would be a lot given how few show up to most meetings to come out and actually start talking about it, so. Yeah, you might be surprised. I, I'm, I'm hopeful that we could get a good crowd, you know, just to either support or have concerns about the project, you know. You might also be able, I'm sorry about focusing on the schools, but you also might be able to ask Paul if he could put something on the, the boards for each one of the schools, because I know Central has one, South Grove has one, I'm not sure how large the high schools is, and I think the middle school has one as well. So one's on 9th Street, one's on 10th Street, so and 10th yeah. and Main, so <coughs> that would give you pretty yeah, good visibility. And I'm sure Dr. Kaiser disability. would support Yeah, that, I'm sure so. he would help you. So yeah, that would be good, and um, they'll be back in school then, so uh, they'll yeah, have I'm people sure they driving would, by. You know, I'm sure they would do it for you in July before they come back to school. Yeah. Trent, do you need any vote from the RDC tonight? No. No, I think if, if we kind of have a nod that the 20th is what we're going to target, then, you know, we'll... we'll the 20th of August? Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah, because you, uh, you, you don't have a June meeting, which would probably be too soon anyways. Right. Uh, yeah. And uh, I'm actually out on vacation when you have your July meeting. And so if we're going to pick a regular meeting, the August still will... August, also... kids are back in school by yeah. the time we have it, and some are starting to wind down. So yeah. right. it'll probably, it'll probably work out pretty well. Okay. Uh, is there any reason why it's just the Carrington community? Because you're touching. No, the, I want the folks from the next neighborhood north. The name is eluding me at the moment. Park Meadow. Yeah. Park Meadow. Yeah. Park yeah. Meadow folks, we need to include them definitely as directly as we can. Yeah, I'm sorry. I, 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 we mentioned that specifically, but uh, we will contact anybody, any of the communities that connect to it. And there were probably some places like the businesses over on, on the, the near end. the east end that we'll, we'll we'll have a flyer and we'll drop those off at the businesses so we can do some of that. But. I had heard that Park Meadow wasn't real thrilled about the idea the last time. What was it, 2004 or five when it was proposed? Yeah. Well, so yeah. I, I mean, I don't know if people have softened or hardened since then because, like I say, we heard it was coming in a matter of a year or two, and it's ten years later. So yeah, right. And people <laughs> have changed probably there too. So. Yeah, uh, but but yeah, I would, uh, and we don't have all the final details. You know, uh, you know, I'm sorry that we don't have more information to share with you at this point. But we're really between now and August going to start going through and doing some cost estimating. So by the time we have that public meeting, we will have a little bit more information. Well, like I say, anything you need from us, just yeah. I'll be gone from the first of June until the fifteenth of June. I'll be in Florida, but. You know, when I get back, I'll check emails, and the other guys are on it. If you need something, just let us know. Like okay. I said, I want to make sure we put our full weight behind this so right. that we're ready come October. I mean, that's the one thing I don't want to be is that we're not prepared or we don't have a really strong presentation. So. Right. Okay. That sounds good. Coordinate between now and then. And, yeah, hopefully, we 40 would be a good number. If we can oh, I would hope so. All right. Any Thank other questions guys. for us? <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Okay.
Okay, um, next will be Maury to speak about uh, signed ordinance. Well, good evening. I'm Maury Planbeck. I'm the administrator of current planning for Department of Metropolitan Development. Longtime employee of the Department of Metropolitan Development. I, I don't really have a presentation. <laughs> I, the, I, the mayor uh, indicated that you had some interest in um, some sign regulations for Beach Grove, mm -hmm. and so I thought maybe we could kind of just have a discussion about you know maybe what your goals are. I brought a couple copies of the sign regu sign regulations. They are online. And I, and I um, you know, they're on DMD's website, and so that's all there. So maybe you could start with some questions of me or discussion. Yeah, you start. You're kind of um, we, if you've, if you've gone down Main Street, oh, you've many seen times. That, you know, there's a lot of signage down there that really doesn't meet any sort of criteria at all. And so what we were trying to do originally was we were trying to use the criteria that Carmel had created for their little downtown city area to see if we could at least have some sort of rules and regulations for everybody to follow so that we could get a better looking signage package all the way down the street so that we don't have people doing banners, we don't have things that aren't framed out, we don't, you know, if you're going to do an awning, this is how it needs to look, that kind of because the sign criteria that we have in Beach Grove is very, very vague. And so we need to create something that's more specific. And then we need to figure out who that would go to to get it approved so that people just can't slap up whatever they want to. Because along with everything we're trying to do on Main Street and, and with our trails and everything, we want to improve the look of, of our business district as well. That's where we are. That's where you are? That's where we are. Okay, so you said you said the caramel thing didn't work. Well, I think some people were a little frightened by it because when they think of caramel, they think yeah. that the signs have to be, you know, so expensive. So we thought that maybe it would be better to start off with working with you and seeing what the rules and regulations are through Marion County or Indianapolis versus just using theirs to start out with and see how specific yours are and if we could adopt something like that. Well, our, ours are yours. The sign regulations are the same. Exactly? Yes. Because they seem to be pretty vague, but when, who was it that was here? Yeah. And came down to inspect a storefront sign that said there were so many here that don't meet any of our criteria. Yeah, probably, criteria. probably what the deal is, is um, they were probably there before the sign regulations were adopted. Okay. Mm -hmm. Grandfathered, yeah, or non-conforming. There's kind of two ways to describe them, but it means the same thing. If you hear me say one, I mean the other. And so, if someone is there, bef you know, before, of course, uh, they have the right because of the laws to keep it that way. Um, so, so the regulations that we have today, and they could be stricter if we if we did something, or you got you all did something here okay. to to make them stricter. So the regulations that we have today all go by the kind of zone that we have. Have So I think most of downtown's C4, but I didn't go check that. But C4 is pretty kind of a heavy commercial zone, really. And so that's why they are not very strict. Oh. And so any C4 in the county follows those same standards. Um, the, the, we have standards for wall signs and how big they can be and how much of the wall. and I. I want to say it's about 20% of the wall. We have standards for window signs. We have standards for um, pole signs, which don't fit on many properties downtown, but a few probably would. Uh, there's another standard for um, projecting signs. Mm -hmm. uh, so what we would, so let me step back. So ways to implement some changes, certainly some sort of financial incentive to help the businesses and we pay. thought about doing that yeah so that if if you if if we started with that as a group mm -hmm. that's our best way to get things implemented okay and um like lit are you familiar with LISC, the local initiative support corporation they're they're in here in indianapolis and they've done facade programs and actually we've been working with them on some facades in some okay. industrial areas recently. So, so maybe um, uh, it would be a good idea to have them come and talk about how their program works. Okay. 
Um, so, and, and basically what it is is I think it's, it's a grant where, let's like say, and I have, have to make up these numbers because I'm That's not fine. doing the program. So say the, the, the sign costs $200. Okay. okay, it'll never be $200, but right. say it costs $200. You know, the owner pays 100 and the grant pays 100 Okay. You know, they're, they're, that's kind of how the program works. Mm -hmm. there, it's a little bit more than just signs, though. Lots of times it's, you know, well, maybe it's painting the building. Right. Maybe it it's changing, changing windows out yes. to make them uh, more visible, things like that. Yes. So maybe that's kind of, kind of a start. Mm -hmm. Another way to do it, which is, is more difficult because anything that's nonconforming, they can keep. Okay, so you have to have an incentive to make the yes. downtown want to do it. So I, I heard you mention Speedway. Mm -hmm. So Speedway, you know, we worked with them and their redevelopment okay. commission, and um, and I know their director very well. They we created actually a zone for them, actually two zones, Speed Zone One and Two, and they did that several years ago, right after they created their redevelopment commission. And the idea was to have a have a transition over a number of years from what their downtown was and what that industrial commercial area south of the Speedway is. That's the Speedway 2 zone. And if you've been there recently, certainly downtown has changed the most. And, and the, the zone is, the zones, uh, like the downtown one is very specific on um, setbacks that are close to the street and uses that promote pedestrian activity. You know, uh, you know they have a museum, I think, in, uh, in that uh, that car uh, Del in the Delari Delorius, whatever that is, I can't Delorean. remember Deloria site. They have a little coffee shop in there. They've got uh -huh. more restaurants. They also have sign parameters in that. So uh, what they did on that program was they had a redevelopment plan, which then was um, they they adopted, and we did bring it to the Metropolitan Development Commission to adopt too. And then we worked together to create these two zones. And then, then Beach Grove, or I'm sorry, your Beach Grove, Speedway worked with the property owners and the community to get their support, sort of like you were talking about for the, for the greenways here. And, uh, and actually the, the zoning was, was non-controversial. People loved it and it went through the process. That was the same time that they were talking about closing Georgetown Road the first time. So there was controversy in that part, but not in the zoning. So, so that's one way, one way to do it. Another way to do it is to, um, well, are, you, are we thinking downtown? Is that what we're thinking? The main street, I mean. Right yeah. So another way would be, and you have to get cooperation with the owners of the property, is, is maybe do a, a rezone of all of the property to a commercial special or something where you write the uses more specifically. And, and, and that, we already have that zone where you don't have to create it. In Speedway, we created a new zone. Okay. So, so the reason I bring that up is so Fort Bend has a redevelopment authority. So when that was created, yeah, that's probably been 20 years ago now. They did a plan unit development rezoning and put sign standards in that. And, that, and then the process includes their review of things before they come to uh, Indianapolis Park for their permits. And, and so what you see up there is a result of, of all of that planning. So a CS is like, like a plan unit development, but for commercial. A, a real plan unit development has to have residential, and you don't have too much residential on your main street. Then, then the third thing that I can really kind of think of right now, but you know, maybe together over the next few months we can be creative, is what's called an overlay zone. So you, you keep the zone that's, uh, that's there, the C4 zone, and then you have an overlay zone that maybe relates to design or signs or something like that. We have it uh, in a couple areas in Indianapolis. Downtown Indianapolis is an overlay zone, and it's called Regional Center. And we have design review of everything downtown. Okay. So there's, there's regular zones downtown that say the uses, well, like some zones allow mixed use, residential and retail, some allow industrial, some allow this. But in addition to you getting to do your use, you have to come in for approval. And signs are a part of that. Um, what kind of, uh, this is just, asking another question, what kind of zoning or what kind of um, criteria do they have like on Mass Ave? Is it a lot different? 
Okay, so then, so another overlay zone is a historic district. Okay. And so, yes, okay. <laughs> it is just, it is different. So uh, there's several historic districts and in all of the historic districts, they all have a plan. Okay. They all have the same zoning, but because they're historic districts, the Historic Preservation Commission has a review of everything on the outside, basically, and signs is included in that. Um, it, it's not too much different than the regional center, the downtown, but, but a they're probably a little bit more strict than, than the regional center because it's they're um, more focused on those historic buildings. So the downfalls to all of these last things are, you know, it's only as people change right. that it comes in, but it, but it might, be a, might be a start. We are in the... So you, you know about Indy Rezone, I assume you've heard about that. We've met with the mayor here and, and received comments from Beach Grove and included them in. So that, that is the land use part of, of the zoning ordinance for Marion County, which includes Beach Grove. We expect that to start going to hearing this next month. In June, it goes to Metropolitan Development Commission and the, then the City County Council. And then if you've been reading about the billboard kind of thing that the City County Council has been struggling with, they, um, they passed a resolution that, I think, believe it was Monday, that as the Department of Metropolitan Development changes the sign regulations, that we include the discussion of billboards in their electronic billboards. The reason I bring that up is after Indy Rezone is adopted, that is the next major thing that we're going to do, is the sign regulations. That in itself is probably just as much work as doing the whole ordinance because people really, really care about signs, both from the people that own them and put them up to the people that look at them and, and, and such. We expect that we'll, we'll start either late this fall or winter, so, so kind of that's like another option that maybe we could work on that. Okay. And so, so I've thrown out a bunch of stuff here and um, we're, you know, we're happy to, to help on that. We can't do too much right now until Indy Rezone is adopted. We just don't have that many staff. But, sure. but as soon as that's adopted, we're more flexible. And like I said, we maybe do. Maybe you could talk about what you might want to do. And I can, I can get in touch, with, you in touch with Speedway, and they can tell you what worked and what didn't. We actually made some changes in Indy Rezone because it's already been in effect for a few, few years and made, made it a little better. We found some problems. They were a little too strict. Do, um, do these uh, criteria, do they also have um, any kind of um, rules and regulations about how the storefronts are done? Like, I, you know, you see stores where they're selling used furniture and they just have everything piled in the window and there's nothing attractive looking at it. Do you have any kind of criteria that maybe that you take back a foot or something and, and you approve that as well. Is that also so included? I know they do that in, um, I don't think it's normal, but it's clay. Clay, I think, clay. around clay Oh, terrace. clay terrace. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, the reason that they probably did that and got to, got to do that in clay terrace is because, you know, that was all one big development and somebody owned it at one mm -hmm. time and they put their stairs, probably covenants in there. The thing that we have is sort of like that, it, it's not. I mean, I just okay. say we, no. The answer is really no. Is if if you do a, a sign inside your building, if it's two feet, I believe, away from the window, then it doesn't meet any have to meet any regulations. Right. Right. It doesn't really talk about can you use a chair as your sign or something like okay. that. But that probably could come about in in the facade kind of program. You know the, that I was talking about with lists. Yeah, I mean, it, could, it could be more than signs. It could yeah, be yeah, things on the front of the building. Facade. Yeah. And that also require like the landlord to take care of whatever problems there is with the brick and things like that to improve the look of the. the yeah, it would all depend. Thing. It would depend on how the program was was written up. Okay. You know, um, like I said, it's not just signs. So many of it, it is fixing brick or fixing windows or changing sure. windows. And so if, you know, if your program was set up that you want, want all dis, you know, displays to have a similar tone or pattern, you, you, could, you could do that, especially when you just have the, the one main street. And, and there, are, there are advantages to that, 
that sometimes are, are hard to sell, but you know, downtowns that are, uh, you know, have a consistent look are, are the kind that people like to go to. You know, and so you, as you're working with the property owners, you'd maybe want to do some research on, uh, on what other cities across the country are doing. If, have you guys heard of the Main Street program, the Indiana Main Street program? So they do that kind of stuff. Their whole idea is you market Main Street by creating a district that, that is, is not all the same, but at least cohesive and consistent, mm -hmm. and, and, it, and it improves everybody's value of, yes. of the downtown. Yeah, and I think that's what we're looking for. We're not looking for somebody, for everybody to look exactly the same, but we do want everybody to be the same level of appearance. Does that make sense? Yeah, oh, oh, totally, yeah. yeah. And, and yeah, you know, I'm thinking out loud a little bit since I didn't pre prepare much, but um, LISC has also done a couple of Main Street programs. So Fountain Square is an well, urban yeah, Main really Street. Nice um, yeah. You know, Main Street was really designed for small towns um, that are by themselves. And so it's been in Indiana for a number of years. Just a few years ago, then, major cities like Indianapolis realized we have downtowns, too, that, that were once their own. And so Fountain, Fountain Square is one, and I th think there's another. I think maybe Irvington is the other one. But LISC really, LISC is a national organization and it has the local staff, and okay. so they really worked on that. And, and so do they help like groups like us who really don't know where to take it or how to take it to the next level? Do they help us create yes. that and we figure out what we need and then they help us determine how we get that done? Yes, they can. Um, they can get lots of resources on what's happened in other places. They have developed grant programs. You know, I'm not LISC, but I think they've given grants to entities like this to maybe help. That'd be great. You know, um, their director is Bill Taft. Um, they have a, they have quite a few staff. I mean, I, I could talk to him if you wanted me to. Did, and he, did he work for Downtown Indy or somebody? He worked for, um, for SIN, which was Southeast Neighborhood Development, which is Fountain Square. He worked there for a long time. He's worked at LISP for a number of years now, though. Not, not for Indy Downtown, but he's, he's been very involved in the downtown development. You found that a 50% subsidy is probably your most effective inducement as you upgrade your, st your sign standards? That, that you would really have to talk to LISC about, because I actually, the city of Indianapolis hasn't actually done that program. but. That just I think that's about the way it goes. I think, yeah. I think the idea is is if if the owner doesn't have any stake in it, that they, they're not going to take care of it as well. Right. You know, if if you pay for it, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. we'll, we'll help you, and then you're probably going to take care of it. Yeah, I agree with that. I have a question about grandfather clauses, businesses that are grandfathered in. Uh huh. Say somebody has the same business for years and years and it's grandfathered in so they don't have to bring it up to date to the new standards. But then that business changes. A new business comes in, old one's gone. Are they still grandfathered in or is that new business required to go by the new regulations? It, it depends. And I'm, <laughs> here's, here's why it depends. So let's go with the, the um, worst case scenario. Okay. You have a business in a house and it's zoned residential. Right. That you could. The only thing you could change is the exact same kind of business. And but an owner can change and all that kind of stuff. You can't put a different business in there. Well, so like if we talk about Main Street, which is zoned C4, you're going to have two kinds of things that are grandfathered. More than not, it's the it's the development standards, meaning the setbacks and and there's not much off street parking and. Those are probably the two main ones. So the building can change uses as long as the uses are the C4 uses. So C4 has a number of retail or commercial uses. Now they can't do something that's not permitted in the zone, but the building's grandfather, then they can do that. Now if there's a use that's, like say it's not a C4 use, say it's a light industrial use, for example, that can only go to a C4 use. You know, you can't go to a different industrial use. But I think maybe um, the question really focused on you've got an owner, and that owner has a sign um, that is no 
non-conforming grandfather, whether you want to call it, he sells it to another business, uh, which uh, then will take that sign off because it's not their name and puts on another sign. At that point, can you require that the new owner, same use, but just different owner, different sign, to conform now to a stricter? Yeah, that's, that's a very good question. There's, there's, and there's a variety of ways to answer that because a variety of circumstances. If he takes the sign down totally, they have to meet the standards, even if it's the same owner. Even if it's the same Even business, if it was grandfathered, grandfathered, it down. grandfathered means you need to keep what's there. You don't get to change it. I see. Yeah, there is an exception to there is an exception to that rule, and it's in the ordinance. If you change the face of it, and let's say it's a plastic face, and the and the company's um, uh, Beach Grove, Beach Grove company's Beach Grove, and they want to change the plastic face to Beach Grove City, they can do that as long as the, the structure is all the same. But if they take it down, they have to start over. So, so and, yeah, and that's today. I mean, so, you know, um, and so like say we come up with something that we adopt next month, which, which probably would never happen as too soon, but next month, then they would need to meet the, that new standard. But if a new owner took over Beach Grove, then we could enforce a new signing regu regulation. Only if they change the sign. If they took the, the structure of the sign down, they can change the face, but not the structure. Yeah, so, so, that, so conceivably, grandfathered signs could go a long time. So your real issue is going to be how you sell it to the merchants and how they benefit from it, which they can, so that they'll want to do it. Do they have to keep the same name? If they change the name? As long as it's just the face, they can change the name, they can change everything. there's no face, it's just like a banner that's stuck up there. Banners sometimes are legal, sometimes are not. So they might be illegal already. Okay. If, if a banner has a, ha, is tied onto the wall in a certain way that meets the structure or stuff. I think actually our rules and regulations say that the longest a banner can be up is 60 days. Yeah, temporary banners are different than, than sign mm -hmm. banners. So, I did drive through tonight, but I didn't look. At, I didn't see any banners. But um, there's one over on Emerson, actually. Okay, it's been up forever. It, once in a while, um, in the city, I've seen people use a banner as their real sign. That's their wall sign, and there's certain structural standards that they have to do to meet that. Uh, I'm not the expert on what those structural standards are because it relates to more of the how they tie it to the wall and okay. that. But, but you could, like conceivably in this new program, say, well, we don't want banners, or, or we only want banners for certain things. Yeah. Mm -hmm. How do you determine whether somebody made a mistake in inappropriate change after a standard went into place? Yeah, there's a there's a couple of ways to, to do that. Well, cer certainly anything where you think it's in violation, where you think they didn't do it right, the zone, you, you'd call the Department of Code Enforcement and have a zoning inspector check it out and cite them. So the way we, yeah, so I work in DMD and in, in current planning, and so we have a bunch of planners. And so we, we'd probably do most of that kind of research. And we have, um, we have all of the, uh, Zoning back as, as kind of far as it goes. So we can check that way. Um, we have the old ordinances. If, if we need to check those, you know, sign regulations have changed over the years. We have all of the records of variances. So, so maybe some of these people got variances, you know, to, to do a sign that didn't meet the regulations. Some of this stuff is online now, but it doesn't go back to 1920s. Then, there, then the other part, um, and, and sometimes we can't prove it. 
And what then we do is make them prove it. You prove that you prove that you're legal. And uh, the other way to do that is what's called a legal non-conforming use, and it's in the ordinance too. It's called LNCU. And it's more for a use thing than a sign thing, but I'll just tell you about it. Is, so the ordinances that we have today were adopted in 1969 when UNIGOV was created. And so if you can prove your use was back to 1969, you don't have to go back to 1923 or, or something like that. So there's a couple ways to do it. It's, if you're the owner, it's really a hard thing to do. And lots of times if, they get, if, if, if they're cited and they can't prove it, they have to get a variance or something like that or take it down. More often they'll apply for a variance. That is, um, zone C4, does that pretty much leave you open for just about anything? I didn't bring my regulations, but it, it leaves you open for many commercial retail kind of uses. It, um, let's see, there can be any office can be in there. It can, you can't have any industrial. You can't have any residential. Um, there are certain standards for different kind of uses. So uh, a bar has to be so far from residential and there's some other uses that have standards like that. But it is a pretty liberal zone. Uh, everything has to be inside except for 200, if you have outside stuff, it can only be 200 square feet. The reason I'm asking, I don't know if I should put this on TV, but um, a person I knew had a, um, a tattoo parlor, which is fine because it was a very nice one, and I'm not, you know. Um, but he had said that sometimes when they zone that area, that zone also includes that they can put in a meth clinic and something else, a methadone clinic and something else. And so, if you wanted a nice tattoo parlor, that's fine. But the, but that also allows those other uses to be able to come in and lets the <coughs> landlord allow those things to be in if they want them. That's why, that's why I'm asking. And it, that he's, he is right in, in theory. I don't remember okay. if methadone clinic is in C4, but it might be. Okay. It, it could very well be. For the tattoo parlor in specific, in specifically, there are extra standards for tattoo parlors. Okay. You don't just get to do a tattoo parlor. You have to be so far from residential and you have to have some other things. Okay. And methadone clinic, I think, has some stuff like that too. Okay. Um, but if you really, like you can email me sometime and, and I can really give you the details about it. I just can't today without the ordinance oh, in front of me. I just thought maybe you knew off the top of your head. <laughs> you have one question. About six months back, some people on Main Street were quite perturbed because I guess the city of Indianapolis has a compliance on zoning and signs and came through and cited a couple of businesses on Main Street. And they were upset because I guess they thought they were in compliance by Beach Grove zoning, but they weren't in Indianapolis. So is the Beach Grove zoning laws more lax than Indianapolis? Do they not match up? They're exactly the same. They're exactly okay, so the same. You know what I'm saying? I, meaning, meaning, actually, they're, they're, not, they're more than exactly the same. They, there's only one ordinance. Okay, so, so does Indianapolis have a compliance person, though, that does look Yeah, like and what they do is that that's what I'm talking about, the zoning inspector from the Department of Code Enforcement. And so, so the, and they do this for the entire county. It's usually by complaint, so somebody probably complained that there was an issue with the signs. And what, what they try to do is not ignore other things right around it, because you know if, if, if two people are in violation and only one complaint is, the, one, the other one that didn't get caught is going to, or the one that did get caught is going to say, why didn't you cite that other? So it's very likely that somebody complained and they came and cited Cited them for things. Would be is, I don't know what I know. We have issues with the signage in, on Main Street, but is there a way? Because again, we don't know the zoning laws or how to interpret them. Is there a way we could have Indianapolis compliance, not necessarily cite everybody, because I don't want to create a war, but go through there and like give a list or what is not compliant or what is out of spec? Because do, you know, to Janice's point, we want to upgrade the signage, but. You know, how bad is the signage now? I mean, if, if we're finding 40% of the business's signage is totally insufficient, then to me it's, it puts more of a driver on the, the RDC, the city council, and the city 
to start working and figuring out how to get the signage, you know what I mean, more professional, more up to date, and better looking. Okay. Whereas if everybody's compliant, we may not like the signage, so then it falls on us to say, you know, you understand what I'm saying? Yeah, I do. There's more of a sense of urgency if we know there's 10 out of 30 businesses on Main Street that are completely not compliant. Yeah. There were, there, I think also the reason he's asking is one of the shop owners on Main Street was involved in the conversation when the inspector came through, and he didn't cite any of the other stores because there weren't complaints on them. Okay, so that's what I'm talking about. Yeah, he said that's there a problem. were very many signs yeah. that did not meet yeah. the criteria that should have been complained um, Well, the, the answer is yes. I'm going to caution you on that, okay. though, because uh, and I can't, you know, I worked here for 20 some years, so it's hard for me to sometimes remember the time frame. That has happened in Beach Grove already, meaning. I think it's former administrations have asked the Department of Code Enforcement to do that. Okay. And it became very uh, controversial in your town. So just think about that. <laughs> and you, so maybe, you know, maybe talk to some people that have been here. You probably have all been here a while, you know, but maybe talk, see if there's any files in City Hall about what happened before. But it was just a few years ago. But you know, it wouldn't hurt if we at least knew who wasn't compliant. We don't have to share it with everybody, but at least we'd have a start as to where we need to look. Does that sure, yeah, you. yeah, what you might want to do, and, I, and, I, and I'm in code enforcement half the time, so you know, I know those, those people very well. As I, I might talk to one of the administrators and see if you know, maybe we can, with it, what, you'd, what I think what you're saying is you, let's, Let's do a little tour of downtown, and you tell us, we tell you, what's not in, in compliance, uh, which is a little bit different than citing a bunch of people. Yeah, <laughs> well, and I yeah, wouldn't want yeah, to cite yeah. it, yeah. you know. Well, say there are 10 businesses that are totally non-compliant. <laughs> it would be nice to know those 10 and maybe present a plan or come to them with an initial plan of, to your point, you know, we are willing to cover 30% of sign advantage to bring you into compliance so instead of having to pay say 1200 for a new sign you know we'd pay 400 of it you'd pay 800 you'd have a new sign and you'd yeah. be compliant and improve Beach Grove uh, you know to where then if they said well no we're not going to do that the heck with you then you got the stick of compliance but I you know because again like I said I'm not in zoning and and on Janice's point I'd have to ask Robert, if, if we did have compliance do that, say, give us a list, could that be a confidential document for the RDC? We, uh, it, it can't, it can't be from us. No. It cannot be okay. confidential. Well, no, what I'm saying though, is if we had someone, like, say, compliance uh, compile that list. I think it'd be a public record. Yeah, anything no, that we do record. is public record. So that's what, that's yeah. what I was like, yeah, so. If somebody wanted to ask for it, yeah, they could ask for it, and it yeah. could be all over town. Yeah, yeah. So, so what, I, I you're not, I don't know if you're asking for advice, but I'm going to give you some. Well, we uh, like what you, we what you might want to do first is figure out what? Yeah. Well, yeah. well, I was thinking maybe, maybe start from what you want the signs to be downtown. Uh, because you've exactly. already kind of said that the regulations we have today are probably not, not what you're thinking about. They just seemed a little vague to me, like... Well, they're if very liberal. Read them and they're, they didn't know what they were looking at. They would have no idea what they were doing uh, right or wrong. Yeah. Well, so so there's so, so well they're liberal. I'll say they're liberal because they're 40 years old. Yeah. Um, the so other thing did, is probably the you know a zoning inspector is not going to know by looking at it if it's non-conforming. Okay. So it might not meet the ordinance, but it might be legal. So, so there's two things there, and the reason I'm suggesting that maybe we figure out what you want for your signage to be, okay. that then you're starting from a point that's a little bit different than the ordinance. Because if you start working on what our ordinance is now, and, and, and I would say you can probably get better than what the ordinance is now somehow, that, that then, you start, then you have to start again when you create your program. So then we're back to what we started with originally. And then I guess we need to go through and filter it and see what we want to take out and what we want to leave right. in, and then we could work with them to see what they thought about what we were talking about. Does that make sense? Does that go that? Way? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we, like I said, we can help you, um, okay. but you probably, yeah, if you could have. 
figure, kind of figure out generally, you know, maybe, t you know, think about what down what downtowns, I mean, small downtowns you like and what you like about them, you know, I mean, certainly go on, on Google <laughs> towns or towns you visited and maybe kind of put together some, something about, oh, this is where we want. And then we come down and say, oh, oh this is how we maybe get there. Okay. I guess that's to me, Irvington. When I look at what Irvington was just 10 years ago, because I play golf at Pleasant Run and drive through there all the time. Yeah. 10 years ago, it was a catastrophe. I mean, the stores looked awful. And now you look, the, the frontages of the stores are nice. They're painted. They're crisp. They're clean. And there's a very good crowd in there. If you go there tomorrow night and this weekend, Irvington will be packed. And it's thriving. And you know what I mean? Whereas I worry with Beach Grove, our downtown businesses have, from what I've heard, relatively high rent, and the businesses that move in there are poor and have enough money for maybe six months of operation. Right. They have a landlord that doesn't really help them. I've heard that from a few of them I've talked to. And so, you know, you're trying to start a business, you don't have money for a signage, so you slap up a banner because your friend works at a banner company and got it for you for next to nothing and right. you know what i'm yeah. saying and that's what i worry about you know is well the good thing is irvington was much different 10 years ago and so they've done things like they, they have a, they, you know they have a d d development director okay. to help implement those kinds of things they're they're a historic district and so they've helped that they've done facade programs that have helped change those facades and then all that together has built to what they are today they've also gotten a bunch of grants for from, from um, I, th I think the state for the street improvements you know they did street improvements you've already done some street improvements here so you know you got to start so so what you are doing is what they did 10 years ago you're starting that process I was worried with the RDC that on this type of thing, I'm not sure our RDC has the infrastructure that will be needed to carry this type of program out. I mean, you know what I'm saying, Janice? I mean, you're we, talking you're we, talking almost full time people to uh -huh. do this, you're and that's that's where I worry because Beach Grove doesn't necessarily have the funds or the resources. I mean, now you know, in about five six years, we will because we will have paid off. Sure. Or six million in debt, but you know that's one of the things I think that limits us is, you know, we you'd almost need a couple of full time people working on this. Well, maybe we could at least get some criteria started right. that people know what we're looking towards as how we'd like to see downtown look. If we could offer some sort of a incentive to help some people, maybe what would happen is if you get three or four to do something then the next group says, well, hey, I want to look yeah. like that too. Mm -hmm. Can you help me as well? I mean, you just don't know, you know, until well, we try and start. I don't, I mean, I agree we'll probably need somebody full-time eventually, but at least we could talk to somebody and see how they got started. Is there, um, is there any entity, uh, I don't know if it's the RDC or if is there any other one in Beach Grove that has the responsibility for promoting downtown in terms of trying to recruit businesses or do, is there any segment of Beach Grove? I think the mayor has been working hard to right. try to do those things. Okay, so the mayor's office takes that role. That's good. Well, because it seems to me that, I mean, I this is not, I mean, I don't want to say this as a, like a definite opinion of mine, but I'm wondering if this is a bit of cart before the horse because um, when I look at what we have on Main Street in Beach Grove, I'm thinking I really, I don't know, I feel like maybe we should try to do something about Beach Grove should, I mean, not the RDC, about attracting, well, let me start over and try to make one coherent sentence here. You say that Friday evening, I'm serious, when you're walking around in Irvington, it's gonna be packed. And my question is, what is there on Main Street in Beach Grove that would cause people to be walking around Main Street at five or six o'clock on Friday evening? 
There is so I'm saying we don't have things there that attract people in those kinds of situations. And therefore, I'm wondering about that happening first because... Well, you're not going to get anybody to come no. down here looking like I that. I think it's catch-22. You're not going to draw new businesses in a crowd until everything looks better and it's, it's not going to look better until yes, you get the right people in there. It's, it's a cycle. It's a cycle. Like, yeah. I mean, catch-22. Yeah, you've absolutely. got a lot of dentist office, a few bars, a few tattoo parlors, so I guess... Lots of Here's hair salons. salons. So you can get your hair done. And lots of second hand shops. Maybe a little dinner. No way. Well, there's a good restaurant right near. Yes, the there's a very nice restaurant. They just had dinner. Absolutely. The other thing is that um, I think that a lot of these landlords don't care about the people that lease the space. That was I'm, my next question. And, and they are rent. charging exorbitant rents because right. I can tell you that on Mass Ave, a guy I know started a business for like $400 a month out of a little building. And the landlord was making money off the back end because he was paying percentage rent because he had a retail business, okay? But some of the people down there, and I can't even give you a name, so I, nobody can say I'm talking about them, are so greedy that they want their money up front, they don't take care of the building, they expect the tenant to repair everything, they don't even fix the ceiling, fix the air conditioning, expect yeah. them to tuck and point the brick, and then they want them to be a successful business. It's not going to happen. Believe right? me, I've been there. That's what we went through with Spotlight Players, the yes. community yes. theater. Yes, right. So you a understand. A prime that. example. Well, yes. I'll tell you, I just got a land. computer fixed up in the Grove, and I was talking to the guy there on 7th Avenue, $1,000 a month rent. You know, it'd be different. He'd be happy to pay that rent. If there were people coming down there to buy, he would pay that all day long. You know what I mean? Right, but I mean, you know, and he he struggles to make it. He's been there a sure while, he does. but you know, he also lives out of the back of it, mm -hmm. and you know, he's got a leaky roof that his landlord won't fix. See? And you that's know, they, just... he owns that whole block of buildings, and I mean, you know, that's you know, that's part of the problem. Is is again, that's why I've I've talked to him about the signage signing. You know, they're, you know, can't they're, afford it. He can't afford even that little bit. He can't afford. And again, why? Because he's that landlord wants his money. Now, the other question I have is, it has nothing to do with signage. Can you hold a landlord responsible for not taking care of his building? Certain parts of it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's a thing called unsafe buildings and stuff. Unsafe, yeah, safe. yeah. I'm not an expert on that, but there are regulations but, but regarding that. Compliance, yeah, it would. But you know, I mean, that's been. But yeah, I've heard a couple of people of people up there just your vicious cycle's right. You've got landlords that are cycle. trying to get every penny they can out of it. You got young businesses starting out, and I mean There was a landscaping company that started down around the Southside Times building. And I went down there to talk to him to help him out. And they were spending a lot of money on the inside of the space, painting and carpeting, and it looked so nice, so very nice on the inside. And the landlord wouldn't fix anything. The windows were leaking. The brick was cracked. The ceiling was leaking. And they ended up leaving. And that's just, that's a shame. Let's see, I don't know how we, again, that'd be something I guess the mayor, I mean, like when we had that big group back here last, what was it, September or August, again, maybe that would be a good focus group is how do we, get landlords or what can we as a city and a redevelopment commission do to get landlords to put more skin in the game i understand it's their buildings but you know to me maybe you know the city needs to have some type of outlet to where if a landlord you know it's no different than like a person living in an apartment if there's mold in the apartment the landlord isn't well that's a health concern and you know you see that all the time you know there's there's laws against slum lords and, and you know bad apartment complexes you know, do we not, does Indianapolis or Beach Grove, do, do, is there something that needs to be in there for landlords and businesses that refuse to keep up their business or for the buildings or facilities? You know? I don't know. Can we? Yeah, there are regulations. You might want to contact Health and Hospital Corporation. They would be the best people, yeah. I mean, there yeah. are regulations. Contact them. Right, right. Health and Hospital Corporation. Health and Hospital Corporation, they do, yeah. they do um, inspections of um, occupied properties. Well, I know this is what happened to the building on Main Street where the theater was, because when we first moved in there in 2008, 
we put a lot of money into new carpeting and painting and it was really beautiful when it first opened um, but if you, <laughs> if you can, words cannot describe the horrible condition of the ceiling in there because of years of leaks after leak after leak after leak and now it's falling plaster we couldn't be in there any longer because it's such a health hazard uh, especially for anyone who's the least bit sensitive to mold it's mm -hmm. just horrible yeah i mean nobody and he will do nothing to And I would think, I mean, that was the old Beals building, right? Right. Yes. I don't know how long they've, what do you consider historic? How long does it have to be, how long does it have to be existing for? Well, when, when, I, when I say historic, I mean that it was actually created and adopted as a historic district. When people talk generally about mm -hmm. historic properties, mm -hmm. it used to be like 50 years, so. Now that I'm over 50, I'm thinking that's not so historic. Like it's kind of, <laughs> it's kind of, it's kind of 50 years is usually what I they think use. Some of those buildings have been down there that long. Oh, long sure, long sure. Yeah, many, yeah. many of the just buildings downtown sure. are older than that. Building, yeah, that, yeah. That brick building on Fifth and Main, it was there in like, it, there's pictures of it from like 1905. I mean, mm -hmm. you can see the trolley running in front of it. Mm -hmm. so. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So can you get the historic, historic society involved? Well, you could, I mean, there's another possibility is create a historic district if you wanted to do that. Um, they're not really so much they're not enforcers. The landlord fixed the building, they'll just turn around and still have to pay for it. Uh -huh. Make changes. Possibly. Right, right. It's, a, it's outside stuff, not, not health right. stuff that you're talking about. Um, it's gonna, it's gonna be a, probably a combination of a number of things. You know, just fixing out the outside, the facade isn't gonna <laughs> fix the problems you're talking about. Um, you kind of mentioned the chicken or egg thing. Yeah. Uh, Irvington did have some uses that got, went in before all the improvements. Um, you know, maybe talking to their d director would know about, well, you know, how did you get the new businesses to move in there? Their, their director is Margaret Banning. And, and she knows about Main Street. Uh, she used to work in DMD, so she what knows a lot. What is her name? Margaret Banning. And um, I think it's the Irvington Development Corporation is what it's called. I wonder if it's possible to hire part-time or as a consultant somebody like her. Uh, it is. <laughs> you know, you would do whatever your process sure, to hire people like that is. Yes, yeah, certainly. I think that's what we would. So, uh, speed, um, Southport has a part-time redevelopment director. Yeah, I mean, I think I think we're going to have to work again with the city administration, the mayor, and mm -hmm. the city council. You know, but I think we have to figure out a plan forward. Is you know, is the first step getting landlords to bring their buildings into compliance? Yeah, there's you no know, point in making them prettier if they're right. unsafe. Yeah. Yeah. You, you know what I'm saying, Janice? Is, Absolutely. Like I said, that's one of the things. And, uh, that's, you know, that's where it starts we, landing. I agree. You know, if you bring the building, if you improve the quality of the buildings, you know, you may improve the quality of the tenants, which then you could theoretically charge the tenants more money as, you know, more customers come in. Right. But, right. you know, like I said, I think about my friend running the PC store, a nice guy, but, you know, he can't afford much else because he's paying this landlord who won't fix his leaky roof and you know he has water issues that he's had to fix himself that's ridiculous and you know it's, it's not his building and he didn't break it but he had to fix it if he wanted to use it so i mean i, I you know that's food for thought further down the road but you know it might be something uh, to discuss with the mayor and stuff like that in the future well more than likely what they're probably doing is they're probably having them sign a lease that says you're accepting the space as is Mm -hmm. But the thing is, the space should be in good working order before you accept it as is. But a lot of people wouldn't know to do that. Right. Sorry, we could just sit here and talk about this for a long time. It's fine. <laughs> Look, I probably can't stand too much longer. That's okay. <laughs> we appreciate you. Yeah, there was. It's been very formative. Yes. Well, let me give you the regulations I have. Right. Yes. Like I said, it's on the line. I just brought three copies. We only have five Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. I'm not going to get your card. I have a copy.
do you have anything else? No, I think. Want to ask about? I'm good. Everybody's good. Do you have any more questions? I'm good. Okay. Thank Good you luck. so much. Thank you so much. You're welcome. You may hear from us again. <laughs> uh, well, I hope to. Okay. Um, next on the agenda, because um, we're almost done here, uh, I had uh, put in funding for security systems in the park, and we're not doing the paving because I think it was more than what we had budgeted for Hornet Park Community Center. So the mayor said they weren't going to do that, so that was 30000 that was budgeted there. And we budgeted 175,000 for construction or improvements of roads and TIF areas, and we only used 134 of that, and that's all we're going to use for the Churchman uh, Avenue grant. Mm -hmm. So that leaves us about 65,000. So I was just going to throw it out here to talk, but I had a a friend I work with talk to me, and he lives above the beach, Sarah Bolton Park, and one of the things that infuriates him is that he was glad we got rid of the tennis courts because people would just park on the tennis courts because they can play basketball but they're too lazy to walk from the parking lot to the basketball court. Uh, the other thing he said is that uh, they still pull up in the grass and park by the basketball court and we know from the past that there have been troubles, fights, and other things that have happened in that basketball court to where you know if you're a mom and dad bringing your seven or eight year old son or daughter down to play in the park and you see that and all that stuff going on it may cause you not to use the park or the facilities and uh, so I suggested to the mayor a couple of weeks ago in an email that I would bring this up to you guys but I want to throw it out there is what do you think about we, we talked about putting it on before we lost the St. Francis money but what do you guys think about maybe trying to do a security system because you know it would help the police out, and if there is a crime down there, we might be able to catch who does it. I mean, the reason we lost the one bathrooms down there is because they vandalized them so much, they're, they just couldn't keep them open anymore. What kind of a system when you're talking about a yeah. whole park? Well, the way I understand it, it would be security cameras. And the mayor said they've already got them at one of the parks. I forget which one he said, but he said vandalism and all that went way down once they were there. And I assume they'd have signs, but um, I would assume there'd be like cameras mounted facing those basketball courts to see what's going on there. There'd be cameras over by the playground equipment, you know. Um, would they be monitored? That's would it be what, in real I, time? I, or I would have to ask, who is it, Tom from the Parks Hannah. Department? Tom, Tom Hannon. And I would also ask the mayor. Um, I think Rex Garvin's on the Parks Department now, too. But I'm just saying, I'm just throwing it out there because we could talk about it or maybe even do it in our July meeting. But if it's something that you guys think might be worthwhile going forward, I would ask Tom and the mayor to come prepared for the July 16th meeting with uh, to be able to answer our questions on that. I think that is a good idea. Do you have any idea of how many incidents we've had at the park? Well, I know when was it about, what was it, about a year ago that they took down the basketball rims because it was so bad down there. So and like I said, my friend, or something. my friend lives above there and, and I mean, they've had kid, gang members come down with guns and knives and uh, it's gotten out of control at times. I mean, well, he wants, he, he, he griped to me that he wants to see more Beach Grove police go through and start ticketing these guys parking in the grass. I think it's a good, I think we need to pursue it to the extent at least of, of at the July meeting getting more information about it so that we can give some serious consideration to what the needs actually are and what we could do. I really, I mean, I would be Could very much in favor of more security. Part of the problem, you think? It might, but again, we are limited on our public safety. Sure, yeah, I understand. And here's what I was thinking too, and I just thought about this, popped in my head like a light bulb. Uh, the security system, if we put it in at Sarah Bolton, and I don't know if it's South Grove or it's covered <laughs> or not, but that might be another thing towards that MPO grant for the greenways, because I'm sure that'll be part of, uh, you know, like they will want some type of security measures along the trail and stuff like that. And since they're going through the parks, we could we could theoretically already have those covered. But I just wanted to throw it out there to see what y'all thought. And if you guys would, if it would be worth having the mayor and Tom talk about that at our July 16th meeting, because I do think, to your point, Ron, I think it would help public safety. Oh, without a doubt. I think if they, 
come for our July meeting, maybe they could come, like Janice said, with some proposal, financial proposals. Yeah, Not just talk about it. Bring the us. The mayor some told me it was details. around thirty thousand, and it would be a security and. Uh, monitored that's a good question that i do not know i would hope it would be monitored so it wouldn't be an <coughs> after the fact but uh i'd also want to see um how many monitors is included for the price and where they're being placed so we can see what the coverage is because it was thirty thousand dollars for like two cameras on the basketball goal and you know right. one's oh, worth, it's not worth it but it'd be not you know to see how many and how it's going to be treated and if somebody actually watches it like ADT or mm -hmm. if it just and tapes point, everything that's want, going on. I'd want good quality cameras. Again, if there is a crime or something happens to a citizen, sure. being able to identify, mm -hmm. find, right. and prosecute who did it to me would be just as important. Sure. Right. Sure. But, I mean, I just, I guess to me, we, we're making investments in our parks, the Greenway, and trying to you know make life for the average citizen a little better and you know you read these stories nowadays you know of uh, people trying to snag little kids you know so somebody gets mad goes back to their car gets out a gun you know I mean it would I don't know if the, I'm not saying this will prevent it but if a criminal is going into the park or somebody's going to the park to do some harm and they see a sign as they pull in that says this place is under surveillance I think it's going to be much harder for them, or they're, in their mind, it's going to click that somebody's watching me. I can't do this. Or if that person who does want to go up to that little kid might think, you know what, there's cameras on me. I'm going to go somewhere else. Mm -hmm. You know, and that, that's just my thought on it. But if you guys agree to it, I'm going to ask the mayor and Tom to come to the July meeting and let them know that if we like their proposal, we'd probably we'd more than likely vote to fund it. I came home from work and I cut through the park and there was a car in the grass by the courts on my way home today. And where they put took up the concrete, it's just piles of dirt right now. I think they're going to smooth it and plant grass. And I'll tell you, I drove through it the other day and seeing all the little kids playing soccer. Once we get the grass in there and get it nice, more soccer field. And I mean, there was a lot. And that, again, when you go through the park and you see all these little kids playing soccer and the parents there and everybody down there using it, makes you feel good about the investment we're putting into the park and, and how much better it will be, you know. Mm -hmm. um, if, if we get to the point where we're talking specifics of placement and uh, issues relating to making the, the cameras Yeah, I guess to me, I'm hoping that since it'll be the Parks Department, that they would look into that and they would have the answers for that is what I'm hoping, is that Tom and them will be able to say, yes, we're going to need nine cameras at Sarah Bolton Park, and we're going to cover the XYZ areas in this area, and, you know, they're going to be of this quality, and, you know, they will be monitored through Marion County, or we'll have tape reels that we can pull them back and see what's going on. You know I mean? But we'll at least have those answers is what I'm hoping. Um, it might be good to have a policeman, somebody from the police department come and let us know like where the most of the biggest problems are in that area, what the problems are, good you idea, know, Janet. and what I will what type they up think. a letter to the mayor and I will CC the RDC board on it, asking him and to Tom, asking them, telling them that we are supportive of this idea, but we'd like X, Y, and Z. And I'll also mention the police office or police department to the mayor. Maybe they, they could come too to that July meeting and all of them you know, could present because we'll give them two months to kind of get their ducks in a row. So, And that's the only other thing I had, if, if nobody has any other questions or thoughts on that is updates. Beach Grove Station is still proceeding. They're still digging. They're putting in new sewer lines. Um, you know, I still I thought I thought they might be starting to put up, you know, more by now. But I don't know if it's been the weather or what. But uh, it it's nice to see that building. And uh, other than that, I don't really have a lot. Does anybody have anything else? Nope. Um, on our agenda. Cost of freedom information. Yeah, I talked to Robert about that. We still. Um, we had 
two complaints filed against us for open door violations. Um, the first one we answered, we answered them both promptly, but the first one we answered and we got a response back from the open door folks. Um, the second one we answered um, as hard as it was to answer because it was kind of the complaint was very confusing and uh, we still have not heard an answer on that. So I've just told Robert to wait until we have everything in. Okay. So I'm hoping, I'm hoping at the July 16th meeting, maybe we'll have it in. Um, I don't know if there's a time frame on them having to respond to that complaint. You know, I'm glad I'm not the one who has to respond to that complaint. Is this the complainant that has to respond no, or them the, it's responding the, no, to it's the complainant? The public, access, the public yeah. access council will have to issue oh. a ruling. Uh, it's a ruling, but or a judgment on an opinion. an opinion, whether we did anything wrong or not. I got you. I mean, it, it's, it's not horrible or anything like that, but we just, we're waiting on that. And then once we have that and everything's done, then we'll be able to say, this is what happened. This is what it cost. This is what it means. So that's, that's part of the reason why I didn't mention it, Mac, is because I, I had postponed it till July. To okay. The end. So, um, like I say, uh, we've paid all the bills. I let everybody know two weeks ago that, you know, the next time we meet, we're July. So I think we're good on the bills, which have been signed. Good. Um, I hope everybody enjoys June. I know I will. <laughs> um, and uh, thank you all for coming tonight. We'll see you July.